Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. This is the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick, and this is Matt Reynolds. We have our, a special guest with us today. Papa Reynolds. Papa Reynolds. Grandpa Reynolds. It's my man. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Pardon me? I said, thanks for being here. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> so today we got Grandpa Reynolds. So a lot of people, I think, listen to this show. They came because we talk about barbells and they learn how to do that stuff better. But over time, we've ended up talking about just life, you know, just being being decent folks. And uh, our Friday episodes are often a lot about that kind of thing. And so Matt said, you know, we got to have Grandpa in here. <laughs> I'm hoping I can get him to sing some Marty Robbins after a oh, while. Marty Robbins. <laughs> He's so good. We'll get there. So, Papa, I want to hear about your highfalutin bougie Growing up in uh, Springfield, Missouri, I know you come from a royalty family, lots of money. Um, no, what was what was growing up in Springfield like for you? Well, uh, we uh, we were not uh, highfalutin and royalty at all. We uh, <laughs> we lived at 242 North National. That's the first place I remember living. That's right across from the quarry wall. It's a park now. They've filled in the quarry. My dad used to work down there in that quarry by breaking rocks with a sledgehammer, and he got 50 cents a load for a, a carload of uh, rock that he would break and then send up to the kiln. And uh, that was before I even started school. Uh, like I say, we, we were pretty poor. We, my, my mother was a nurse and my dad broke rock and uh, I just played and had a good time. <laughs> you had uh, two brothers and a sister. Right? That's correct. Tell us about That's your siblings. Right. Uh, my brother Jim was uh, four years older than me, and my sister Pat was six years older than me, and my brother Les was seven years older than me. And my, my sister carried me around when I was a baby. She thought I was her baby doll. And all of my life, all of my life, she was a very protective of her little brother. Yep. When uh, when you got around me, you better not mess with me if my, <laughs> my sister was around, or she'd take you down. She'd take you down, take you out. Aunt Pat's awesome. How long how, how long ago did she pass? Uh, been... It's been about six years now. Oh, my gosh. It goes by so fast. Aunt Pat was a firecracker. She was about 5'1". Or yep, so. 5'2", right. 5'2", and, you know, 100 pounds of nothing. Right. Right. And uh, she would she would murder a man three times her size. <laughs> <laughs> she was head security for a major department store. It's like a region. She was the regional security manager, yes, right? Not was. like for a so, single or, store or several stores. And she has lots of stories of you know carrying out guys my size out, and pinching them by the ears, and whooping right. their tails all the way outside <laughs> the store. And then uh, I can remember we went fishing. You guys started to go fishing in Canada in what year? You remember what year you guys started going up there? Uh, about 1969 and went just about every year until oh, 40 years, Yeah, 40 years. We and I got to go a couple, my first year I got to go, I think you had to be 13 to go. So when I was 13, I got to those go. Are the, those are the rules. Yeah. Right. So it's a, you know, coming of age sort of thing. And, and aunt Pat was there and I just, I just, I just remember her holding her own against all these, you know, all these big guys. She's this little, I mean, she was a firecracker. She'd put you in her place and. And uh, she was she was great though she was she was awesome to deal with so and then may I tell you one story on her yeah, that for please. sure I mean you know she can't do so, anything about it now <laughs> it was so much fun uh, we were having a fan picnic one day and uh, she and I went to Walmart to pick up some goodies to take to our family picnic and when we got to the checkout line there was a man right in front of us uh, tossing these things on there to be checked out. And he said, now this item here is on sale. And the young lady said, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but that's not on sale. And he grumbled a little bit. And he pursued and he said, now I know this thing is on sale. And she said, sir, I am so sorry that is not on sale either. And he threw the, everything he had up there and started cussing and then walked out of there. And then we stepped up to the counter and I looked at these two ladies behind the counter and I said, you think he was tough? You wait, you wait on us. <laughs> <laughs> and about that time, he came back in around a sign. He had just disappeared around behind a sign. And he came around and he started right at me. I'm the only man there. Three ladies there, including my sister, and two other ladies behind the counter. He started right at me and saying, you think that's funny? You think that's funny? And kept coming close to me. And my sis stepped between me and him <laughs> and, and said, hey, jerk, out the door now. <laughs> and he looked at her kind of funny and took one more step towards me and she hit him right in the knees with the cart that she was pushing. And she said, did you hear what I said? Jerk out the door now. And he went right out the door. And these two ladies behind the counter was shaking. <laughs> and she looked at them and said, never mess with my baby brother. <laughs> and how old was she when this, when uh, this story she, occurred? She was about 80 years old. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm guessing, for knowing that Pat, that the term jerk was cleaned up a little bit for the podcast. <laughs> that's, that's very possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then Uncle Les, your oldest brother, right? Old, or is Jim the oldest? Yeah, no, Les was the oldest. Yeah, so he became assistant chief of police in Springfield. That's correct. That's and correct. Uh, one of the funniest guys you'd ever meet. This guy could, oh, his stories were incredible. He had bigger ears than you, which is which is uh, that's hard something. to imagine. So, <laughs> but uh, and you guys became uh, you guys were really close. Yes, yes, we were. We're not not when we were younger. Yep. She was seven years older than yep. me, so we weren't very close when we were younger. But when we were both married, we spent a lot of time fishing together and bowling together, and spent really too much time away from our wives. <laughs> <laughs> we loved our time uh, bowling and going to the lake and stuff like that. So. Yeah, we, we got very, very close. Did he help get you on? You you became a police officer in Springfield, Missouri. Yes, and... I'm sure he had something to do with me being hired very quickly. And yeah. then how long did you work? What was working like a police uh, officer uh, like? Uh, three years. Three years. Yeah. 67, 68, and 69. I was, on, I was on the police force. Any great stories from the uh, police days? The, the story that sticks in my mind so much was... Uh, it was a beautiful summer night. It was about uh, 11 o'clock at night, and I had a reserve officer riding with me, and we were in about the 200 block of South Glenstone. There was a service station inside there, and they had a soda pop machine. We'd pulled a soda pop out. and was sitting on the machine uh, drinking some soda pop, and I got a call saying there had been a shooting in the 1700 block of uh, East Cairo. And... Uh, my lieutenant come on the air and said, car three, stay away from that location till I get there. Well, we were only half a block away from that, that place when that happened. So I, I disobeyed those orders and we jumped in the car and drove right up the street. And there was a lady lying with her feet in the street and her body on the parkway. And when we pulled up and stopped, uh, an older couple came out of the house and said, that's our daughter. And said the man that was renting from her was dragging her up the sidewalk by her, the hair of her head. And she jerked loose, and uh, she started to run, and he shot her three times in the back with a twenty-two. Wow. And then, then he, they said he just left here just now in a two-tone white and blue Plymouth and turned south on Glenstone. I jumped in the car and radioed that to the headquarters. And a friend of mine uh, was driving the, the next district south, happened to be at Sunshine and Glenstone when that happened, and this fellow run a red light right in front of him. He pulled in behind him, and the guys pulled over towards the curb real slowly right there in front of the plaza and uh, put that twenty two rifle to his head and killed himself. Good. And the story has no ending to it because we know no one ever knew what the situation was. Wow. Were they having an affair? What was going on? No one knew. Wow. But all we knew was both of them were dead. Yeah, that's crazy. There is some justice sometimes. I know, right? It's crazy. Amen. Amen. So then you, did you start at Eagle Sheet Metal after that? Was that your... Actually, I'd had two years of apprenticeship in Eagle Sheet Metal work before I went on the police force. Okay. So when I left the police force, I came back to Eagle and spent another 38 years at Eagle Sheet Metal Works. As, as everybody does in that generation, right? right. Like everybody just worked one job forever. <laughs> What was that like, 38 years? Did it ever get monotonous and old, or was it just like, this is what yes, you did? Yes, somewhat. And, and every job gets monotonous in some way. Yeah. But, but, but I was uh, good at what I did, and uh, I worked in the feed mills uh, for my, my company most of the time. A lot of times down to big MFA feed mill in Aurora, and quite a bit of time in the feed mill on uh, MFA feed mill on Boonville Street. And uh, did a lot of work for them. I, I saw my, I saw my, you know, 38 years. You see your metal all over the top of those buildings, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just, just kind of fun to be a part of it. And you said that you know everything gets monotonous after a while, work wise, and it does. You know, I think a big trick is to trick yourself into enjoying what you're doing. Because absolutely, my dad told me that whatever I did, I'd hate it in 10 years anyway. <laughs> right. So, so go get paid and then uh, try to find a way to like it, you know? Yeah, sure. You bet. You bet. You bet. You, bet. you got to do a lot of crawling up hundred feet above the ground and walking around on pipes. And yes. Yeah. I, I worked high when, when I first started, it was spooky to me, but after a while it became second nature. I was just as comfortable 300 feet in the air on a swing as I was standing on the sidewalk. Uh, you know, I just didn't. I'm, I'm still not comfortable with it. <laughs> I walked across, I was in Haiti last week, and probably a lot of our listeners don't know that. I was on, on, in Haiti on a, on a mission trip working with uh, kids that had kind of been saved out of, out of slavery. And uh, at one point, we were w walking the neighborhood and, and trying to kind of see what we were getting into. And we had to walk across a bridge that was. <laughs> a rope bridge? It wasn't a rope bridge. It was like a sheet metal. Like the metal was, you know, 
like a sixteenth of an inch thick sort of metal, and uh, and there were holes all in the sheet metal, and uh, and underneath is the the river with this which is just loaded with trash, and it was way down there. I mean, it was it was at least one hundred fifty <laughs> feet down, and uh, boy, they made fun of me. I, I walked across and I was praying all the way across the thing that I, I wouldn't fall through because I knew a human. My size hadn't been across that bridge. No, you're the size of five. Yeah, Haitians. probably ever. As a matter of fact, as soon as I walked across it, the Haitians started clapping, and they were like, "All right, we can party on this bridge now. <laughs> so uh, uh, we can get across this bridge." So you got to tell us the story about meeting your bride, because it's a, it's one of my favorite stories. Is uh, when you guys first met. I'd, I'd love to tell that story. I was uh, starting the fourth grade, <laughs> which would have been like 1942. At 43, we uh, just had moved back from Portland, Oregon. We'd lived out in Portland, Oregon uh, during the wartime, just one single year. We came back to Springfield, and we uh, bought a little farm out north of Springfield, and I started Pleasant Valley, which is a little one, one of them little one-room schoolhouse you still hear mm-hmm. about. And uh, there was uh, four or five girls, five girls and two boys in our class. And one of those girls was uh, Shirley Ann Stafford. And Shirley Ann had uh, blonde hair, hair that hang way down below her waist. And uh, she looked like an angel. And I was uh, pretty well smitten the first time I ever looked at her. But I thought that she was way out of my class because <laughs> her dad owned a grocery store. And we, we couldn't hardly afford to go in a grocery store. <laughs> so I just assumed that they were millionaires. They owned this grocery store. Well, found out a few years later, of course, that they were just barely eking out a living in that little store. But anyway, I didn't, I didn't think about her being a girlfriend because, because she was far in my class. But we played together, rode bicycle together, and spent some time together. And in, uh, in the summer between our fourth and fifth grade year, there in front of her store was an ice house where, they, remember, where her dad kept block ice. And there was an ice pick stuck in the wall there, and she pulled an ice pick out of that wall, and she carved A.S. plus L.R. That was Ann Stafford plus Lynn Reynolds. And my cousin said, I know what that is. That's uh, Ann Stafford plus Lynn Reynolds. And she said, yeah, I like him, but he don't like me. And I said, oh, but I do, but I do. But the relationship started right then, the summer between our fourth and fifth grade year. We started calling each other boyfriend and girlfriend, and it's lasted all the way through grade school, high school. We graduated from high school in May of 53 and was married in August of 53 and was married to that lady for 60 years, eight months, and nine days. Mm -hmm. And as I share so many times uh, with people with my thing, I tell them about our relationship. I would love to tell them that, it was a beautiful, wonderful relationship the entire 60 years, eight months, and nine days. But actually, uh, after being married to her about six or seven years, I got pretty pretty hung up on myself. And uh, my brother and my bowling and my golf that I enjoyed so much became more important to me than she, than she was. And I really did not treat her well for so many years. And then one day, God broke my heart for the way I was treating her. And when he did, he really showed me through his eyes the way I'd been treating her, and it truly broke my heart. How old were you when that happened? Well, it was uh, 1992, so how old would I have been? I'm born 1935. So it's, you know, anyway. anyway. 63? Yeah, Yeah, sounds about right. But uh, I'm on my knees. If you've seen the movie Fireproof, uh, when Caleb got down on his knees next to that bed with his wife apologizing to her, I have treated you so badly. I've been so selfish. I went right through that same conversation long before that movie was ever made, looking her in the eye with tears running down my cheeks and saying, sweetheart, I will never treat you that way again. Nobody or nothing will come between you and me unless it's Jesus himself. And I've I've told everyone she would love to believe that, but I treated her so badly so long it had to be proved. Right. So it, uh, it probably took two to three years before she knew in her heart that I meant exactly what I said, that our relationship was that, that beautiful. And it, it just got more beautiful all the time. Every year, God made it sweeter and sweeter until the Alzheimer's disease started taking her away, which was somewhere around um, oh, oh 06, 26, that this, she really started bothering her and bothering her. And of course, got worse and worse and worse and worse. And finally, uh, she got to the point where she, I took care of her every day, and she, but she got to where she was an invalid, and I had to put her in a nursing home, which broke my heart. But the nursing home was only about three minutes from my house, so I could get her out of bed of the morning and uh, feed her breakfast. And again, at noon, I would feed her lunch. 
and spend time with her. And uh, it was it would even even, you know, b- before before I put her in the nursing home, she had ordered me out of the home a couple of times. She said, you're not you're not my husband. He's probably dead. I haven't seen him for years. But when she was in the nursing home, I was the only familiar face that she knew. I would walk in. I'd start down the hall. And you all know how nursing home people look. She'd be sitting in a wheelchair and she'd be like, like this. And all of a sudden she'd go. And the nurses and the aides would say, look at Shirley, look at Shirley, look at Shirley. And I'd get closer to her and she'd hold her arms up to me and, and hug me. And I'd kiss her and she'd say, thank you, Jesus, for bringing my good man to me which was a gift of God to me and blessing to me. But uh, then on, uh, on uh, the 11th day of, of uh, April of 2014, I went in to see her at 9 o'clock in the morning. The hospice nurse said, uh, call your family in. This is the day she's going home to be with the Lord. And so my family came in, including Matt here and uh, daughter-in-law's <laughs> Uh, grandkids and great grandkids and the, the grandchildren brought a couple of guitars and uh, we sang hymns and uh, praise songs and uh, had a service and the people in the nursing home was gathering around the door listening to our service we had and it, it lasted from about noon on that Saturday morning until 3.20 in the morning uh, of the Sunday, Sunday morning when she, all of a sudden she stopped breathing and I, when, they, when she stopped breathing, I told my family, she's gone. Gather around the bed, let's hold hands and thank God for her life. And we did. And she was gone. And I miss her very much. But every single night when I go to get ready to go to bed, the last thing I do is turn the thermostat down and her picture hangs right above the thermostat. And I reach up and I kiss her and I say, sweetheart, I love you so much. I'll see you in the morning. And I have that promise of God that I will see her in the morning. What morning? I don't know. He has told me it's none of my business. <laughs> He'll take me when he's ready. <laughs> I love the, you know, grandma was a, uh, she was a, like a perfect 1950s wife, like the kind of wife you, you picture, you know, or, uh, just, I, I remember Christmas and Thanksgiving. It was always. I'm sorry. <laughs> By the way, this is his genes that did this to me. So all right. you guys that hear me cry on this thing, it's his fault. Uh, I've never been in a church service with my grandpa where he doesn't yank out the hanky and blow real loud about ten times. Uh, and uh, you know, amazing cook and the kind of thing that like the kind of life that we want to live. Um, I can remember. Um, you said it. So you said that that your marriage really repaired in ninety three. Is that what you said somewhere in there? What'd you say? Ninety two. Ninety six. Ninety six. So I was seventeen. And so you guys have been married thirty uh, forty three years at we, that point. Well, that's uh, we were married sixty years, eight months, and nine days when she passed away. Yeah. So yeah, so it's, yeah, so that's about right. Yeah, so forty years. Yeah. Of uh, of just a just a a marriage that was just sort of stuck in a rut. Yep. And. Yep. Uh, I can remember the impact that that had, that your marriage being repaired had on our entire family, you know, because they were really the patriarch and the matriarch of our, of our family. We were very, very close family. And still then, are. Don't forget it. Yeah, no, no I know. <laughs> He'll still whoop me. Um, yeah. And so it's, it just made a, it made a huge impact. One thing I love about going over to, to Papa's house is <laughs> there's only been one change to the entire house since grandma died. And my grandma's house First off, I think it's fair to say grandma had some OCD. Is that fair to say? Is that fair to her? Would you, would you tell me what OCD is? Oh, on? like obsessive compulsive. Like she was the cleanest human you've ever met oh, in your yeah. life, right? There was no cobwebs. She, there was no dirt. No, I mean, you could eat off any toilet anywhere <laughs> at all times. All her, they have a big library of books. And she had taken all the books and she covered them with contact paper so they would right. all match exactly the same, right? So they that's she just a true story. deal with the different – not only is it a true story, they're still, they're still in there like that, that's right? That's right. And so um, – and the house, the house is still – she had a, she had bedrooms that she would do in color themes. So there's right. the green room and there's the red room and there's right. – you know, and I mean it's still exactly the same. There was only one change that occurred after grandma left. And, uh, and it's that she had a piano. My grandma was this amazing piano and is this thing that we, we always did as a family. We would come in and we would sing Christmas songs together and stuff at Christmas. Right. I'll sit around the living room. Grandma would play Christmas that, you know, it was very, very, it's a wonderful life sort of, sort of thing is what it was. But of course, when, you know, when grandma passed, nobody could play the piano. And so right. that piano has been replaced with like a 74 inch television. <laughs> and, uh, it was right. I mean, the piano was the, was the center focal piece of the living room. So the piano's out, the TV's in, but other than that, it's all the same. And you joke, you joke 
that we'll go over. Grandpa will invite me over, and we'll, you know, I'll go over and watch the World Series with him or something. And uh, and he, you know, we'll have we'll have cheese and crackers and drink a soda or something. And he'll say, "Man, I just I can still hear Shirley saying, Lynn Reynolds, don't you let them eat in my living room." And that uh, <laughs> so it's like Grandma's rules still uh, still hold true. Yeah, I still think of that. Every time I fix me a bowl of cereal and I go in the living room to watch the ball game or the golf tournament, I can hear her say, just as I turn that corner with that bowl of cereal in my hand, Lynn Edward, don't tank food in my living room. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's good. You have uh, played golf your entire life. Yes. You're a big golfer. I always joke about how, how many holes of golf are you playing a day now? Uh, not nearly as many as I used to. Yeah. Now, now we're playing 18 holes and we're going home. But for many, many, many years, we played 36, 45. Well, there has been days we played 72 holes in one day. <laughs> I, I, have, holes. I have had yeah. nine hole in ones in my time. The most average golfers never have hole in one. But one good friend of mine from church said, let me see, you play 36, 45 holes and you play five days a week, maybe six Boy, that's a lot of shots at a par three. It makes sense. Some of them would go in. The <laughs> Eventually, some of, them, some of them go in. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So tell us about your kiddos. I have three sons, Ron, Steve, and Dan. And by the way, Dan, on the 13th of February, turned 60. That makes He's all the baby. Th- that yeah. makes, that's my baby, and that makes all three of my sons in their 60s. I said, you know, you're old when. When all three of your sons are in their 60s, you're, you're, you're an old man. But I had uh, 12 grandchildren. One of those grandchildren perished uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, uh, uh, lifting weights, by the way, guys. <laughs> he, he, by the way, let me, let me inject. So those of you guys that have read my article called Barbell Safety, that article was written because my cousin Kenny got stuck under a barbell on a Smith machine bench press. I, I don't know how to handle this with my family. I'm the weightlifting guy, you know, and they're asking right. questions. And so those of you guys that have read that article, that, that came out in response to, to the death of my cousin, Kenny and your, your grandson right. a few years ago. And right. so, so you got 12 grandkids, 12 grandchildren. Got, I've got 17 great grandchildren and my 18th one will be here in probably less than a month. Yep. So I'd say the Bible says, blessed is a man whose quiver is full. <laughs> I'd say my quiver is full. However, it's still filling. So <laughs> excellent. The question is, will you hang on long enough to get some great greats? That's what I'm wondering. Uh, your, your daughter they just the, turned 13. Let's not, they, let's not push anything. <laughs> <laughs> I've got two granddaughters now 13 years old. If I live another seven years, I will be 90 years old and I could have some great, great grandchildren. That's true. Not one of my favorite. I think my favorite memories of growing up with you is we would take these uh we would take these road trips so when i was a kid we lived in memphis my dad had taken a a church outside of memphis to actually outside of west memphis right as you guys have heard the story and uh you know grandma grandpa lived in in springfield and and so we would end up doing several road trips a year from springfield to memphis which at the time that was before the speed limit went up that was probably a six to seven hour trip out to memphis now you can you can hum it at about five. It's a little faster. And uh, you always drove really crappy cars. You had a crappy old Buick, I remember, right? Isn't that uh, right? Yes, yes. And 70, 76 Buick. 76 <laughs> Buick. Yeah. And he never, I remember Grandpa never locked his car. I can remember Grandpa taking me to Bass Pro as a kid. You know, Bass Pro's the headquarters are here in Springfield. And um, and that's kind of when you're poor, that's a place to go, like, hang out. And it's you entertaining. Go and, yeah, it's entertaining. You go and you can look at the fish tanks and the turtles and all sorts of stuff. And so we'd go. And I can remember Grandpa taking us to to Bass Pro, and, and he uh, took his keys and threw them under the floor mat in, in his in his Buick and just shut the door and left it unlocked. And I said, Grandpa, Grandpa, you didn't lock your car. And Grandpa would say, hey, look around, look around the parking lot. <laughs> Find the one car you're not going to steal. <laughs> He's like, that's why we leave it unlocked. It's, it'll be fine. And so, uh, but then he would take us on these road trips. And the best part about the road trips was he would sing these songs. He would sing Marty Robbins songs. He would sing, um, who sang Big Iron and Sip? Is that's that Marty Robbins? That's, that's also Marty. Marty Robbins. Yep. That was my favorite. You'd sing these old country, is it called is it country? I mean, is that like early? What's the style well, he was. of that? I mean, it's just country cowboy. Western. Yeah, just cowboy songs. And yeah. so, uh, Marty, Marty wrote most of those songs. Yeah. Um, El Paso. I think El Paso is my favorite. Yes. My favorite song. So I would love to get, if you can, early in the morning, a few bars of, yeah, let's do 
out in the West Texas town of El, pa- El Paso. El Paso. We, we do that? Yeah. All right, let's sing it. This is, and it was the one, you know, there's no mute. He didn't play the tape. It was acapella. All from memory. Oh, yeah, he just sang it acapella. So it wasn't like a tape or an eight track and the 76 Buick was in. He would just sing this stuff. And so. I would love to get a few bars. That was a that was a part of our trip to 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 uh, Canada fishing. Yeah, to always sing those Marty Robbins songs yeah. on the way. Yep. Out in the West Texas town of El Paso, I fell in love with a Mexican girl. Nighttime would find me in Rosa's Cantina. Music would play and Felina would whirl. Blacker the night were the eyes of Felina. Wicked and evil while casting their spell. My love was deep for this Mexican maiden. I was in love, but in vain I could tell. One night a wild young cowboy came in, wild as the West Texas wind. Dashing and daring a drink he was sharing with wicked Felina, the girl that I loved. So in anger, I challenged his right for the love of this maiden. Down went his hand for the gun that he wore. My challenge was answered in less than a heartbeat. The handsome young stranger lay dead on the floor. I believe that's enough, don't you? That's, that's good, man. I'm glad. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. So Love Marty Robbins. It's so good. I noticed so your good. lips was moving with oh, every word. Every word. Yeah. <laughs> Out through the back door of roses I ran. Yeah. <laughs> you betcha. Yeah. You betcha. So, it's so good. I know every word of that song right now. I don't know end. if I can hit the high notes. So. <laughs> you know, we um, we have talked a lot about um, the... Well, i got to talk more about Marty Robbins. That's a waltz. There aren't very many waltzes anymore, you know? Is it really? That, yeah. um, it's that, yeah. that... One, two, three. One, yeah, two, yeah three. it is. Out through the... Yeah. yeah. I'll be. I didn't even thought about it. Yeah, no, not very many. You know, yeah. Some, yeah, not very many. That's good. We've we've talked so much about um, the refining power of voluntary hardship via weight lifting. And I think both, Scott, you and I both feel like there are some certainly some lifestyle aspects to this to this podcast that have, that are just so closely tied to the those of us who are um, drawn to this lifestyle of voluntary hardship and doing what's right and leading our families well and leading our businesses well and being a, a good husband and good father and, and good leader. Um, man, I don't think you can find a better guy than the guy sitting at the end of the table. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thankful. Uh, Thank you, Matt. Thank you. So I love Thank it. You. I appreciate you, you <laughs> modeled being a, a husband and dad for me. Um, and to my dad, who is a great father as well. Yes, he is. He certainly is. loves my mom, loves my mom, loves his yep. kids. And, um, you know, God has really blessed our family because of the way you've led. And I know you would look back and say that there were many years that you didn't lead the way you should have. But, right. but I think um, I think that's he, part of it, too. It is. It is. He's, yes, you know, it he is. was able to come out of that. And he was very he was very open and honest with the family, not just with his wife, but with all of us. And said, this is not I haven't been the dad and husband I should be. And so, um, and he, and you know, it was a change. It was a big change in you and it changed the entire family for sure. By the way, uh, I, my, I have the, the opportunity to share this same stuff that you're talking about. Well, I mentor about 10 different people that I meet with some of them weekly and some of them monthly. And I, I share with them, don't, don't be satisfied with a pretty good marriage, a decent marriage. You don't have to do that. Yeah. You can have a wonderful marriage if you will just give your marriage to God. Yep. Mentor a bunch of young guys in their 50s and 60s. Yes, that's right. Is that, <laughs> that's is that how old most that's of them right. are in their 50s and 60s, the guys you mentor? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So in 96, you went to your wife and you said, I haven't done well. I could have done better, et cetera. Yes. And so did you, I mean, you were aware of that, I guess, right? So you had it coming out you took, and you made yeah. amends with everybody, I guess. We, about we that. didn't, we didn't hide that fact at all. We didn't hide that fact at all. Uh, they all realized uh, that I was not treating my girl right wondering why she was staying with me. And, and when, <laughs> like uh, when God brought me to my senses, uh, I looked back and I, I wondered the same thing, right? Because yeah. let me tell you, if she had had friends that meant more to her than I did and hobbies that meant more to me that I don't believe I'd have stayed with her. So it was a right. God, a God thing that, that uh, kept us together. And uh, so I can remember before the change, I mean, you, you guys have lived in the house that you live in now since I was about three, probably we lived there uh, 37 years. 
Yeah. So yeah, I'm 30. <coughs> how old am I? Am I 39? Yeah, 39. 39. So gosh, I still remember the house on Route 5 you lived on. I remember doing like Easter egg hunts and stuff out there. You were out on you right. five, five, six acres or something. You have some, you had some acreage out there, right? And uh, so I can remember when you moved to the house, but all my life, I can remember as a kid walking in the front door of your house and you would be sitting in the recliner in the corner and grandma, and then there was a couch between, so there was a recliner and then a couch and then another set of like couches and love seats. And grandma would be sitting over there on those love seats. So there would be an entire couch between you and grandma. And when things changed, <laughs> I would walk in and grandpa would be sitting on the couch and grandma would be sitting on his lap. Uh, I mean, they'd be, you know, they, they were 70 years old and, and I'd walk in and for the rest of my life, like I never walked in that they weren't sitting within four inches of each other um, forever. You know what I mean? Until that. And then, you know, he, he told the story as best as he could. But man, I watched this guy. How long was grandma in the in the nursing home? She was in the nursing home at just, just over eight months. For eight months. Every day, yeah. every day he went and woke her up and served her breakfast. And then he would, and then, and she, but at that point she was sleeping like 19, 20 hours a day. I mean, she slept all day. They didn't get up for breakfast. So they'd either sleep in until lunchtime. Yeah. I'd, I'd get her up yeah. and feed her lunch and then, then get, then uh, get her up and feed her supper. She'd go back to bed in the afternoon yep. and uh, they had this beautiful entry room there in the nursing home. And, and after we would eat, I would take her up there to that uh, room and I would take her out of her chair and put her on the couch and sit beside her and hold her hand and tell her over and over and over how much I loved her and sing love songs to her and uh, people coming in. <laughs> <laughs> could tell, could tell how deep the love was. Yeah, I could remember walking in, and you know, Grandma's head would just be laying on your shoulder. Yep. Anyway, so it was. It's such a sweet story. It's a, it's a sweet love story. It's a, it's a amazing story of of redemption and reconciliation, and uh, you know what we strive to be. And I think it's important to to note that uh, you know none of us are perfect. We're not going to do it right from the very beginning. That's right. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you were open and honest about the your own downfalls. It made a big change in our lives to. To understand what it looked like to take responsibility for your actions and and move forward and man i'm i'm thankful for you thanks for coming me, here me too yeah too. thanks for telling thanks the for stories coming and doing that thanks for having me guys i appreciate Absolutely. it god bless you so for the ones of you that stayed here until the end of this you go clean up your stuff today that's right this man did it set your house in order that's not easy that's no, not, not easy no. <laughs> yeah agree. thank you guys yeah. thanks